I don't know. All right. So, uh, hey, everybody. My name is Ali. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. All maybe, right. Maybe I should stand on this side so that you can click. The I can click. Okay. That's right. So uh, we're going to talk about Agile and Scrum today, mm -hmm. and um, how we've been using that at CCP to make uh, Eve and other projects. Uh, this is going to be focused a lot around uh, Apocrypha, which is our latest released expansion. Mm -hmm. And uh, but this is how we've then since then done business. So I'm Ali, and uh, I'm a technical producer. I work in the uh, core technology group, and I've been the, with the company for a long time. And, yep. and I'm, I'm, no, I'm the lead game designer, but I also function as a product manager of EVE in a team with uh, Torfi Franz, the senior producer, and um, Nonni, the technical what director. Is the technical director. For and Eve. Yeah, so we kind of make the the tripod of, of the development. All right, and we'll explain that later, how that works. Yeah. All right. Um, and so we have these certification from the Scrum Alliance, which are, you know, we are accredited to. I'm a certified Scrum product owner and a certified Scrum master, and Noah is a certified Scrum product owner. Yep. And we've got so a couple we're, more we're in the audience. to know what we're talking about. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. All right, so um, Eve Online, uh, was originally launched in 2003. And to give kind of context on what it is that we're talking about, we're going to talk a little bit about how it came to be originally and what we used to make Eve uh, before we started using Agile and Scrum and kind of this new cool stuff. <laughs> um, so uh, when we started working on Eve in 1999, prior to me joining the company, um, we, we, we decided to take an approach called the state's delivery approach, which is, like so many agile methodologies, both iterative and incremental, uh, but um, uh, with, with much larger uh, iterations. So every increment in a state's delivery approach would be a, a full project lifecycle, uh, where you do upfront planning and implementation and testing and documentation and, and create a vertical slice of the product with a specific feature set. Um, and then start a whole new product, uh, project again around that. So you would deliver your, your, your product incrementally over time. And uh, this was introduced by a guy called Steve McConnell in his 1997 book, uh, Software Project Survival Guide. And this is what we adopted when we, when we did Eve. And so the first incarnation of Eve uh, was this. This is what came out of the first stage delivery of Eve Online. And if you've been to FanFest before, you might have seen this. This has been shown uh, one or two times. And this is uh, the Eve client after Orion was the stage delivery, I think it was. And, uh, and uh, here we have you know, Hilmar and Eckert talking. Uh, and flying around in space, and uh, and uh, yeah, talking in Icelandic, he says, "Hey, hey, dead ships are faster than living ships." To heal, I'm gonna fix my microphone. It's it's my it's, my it's the stubble. Yeah, it's my <laughs> very, it's very manly. manly. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, the next stage delivery would then be a whole new product lifecycle for, for Eve Online. We would you know, do upfront design, do documentation, implementation, tests. And, uh, and once we got this more and more mature, we started doing uh, uh, websites, internal websites for each stage delivery. And we, and we started doing marketing material for each stage delivery. And this was getting to be more and more like the released product for each stage delivery that we did until the product was released in, uh, in 2003, uh, which is, yeah, now six years ago, more than six years ago. Um, and so after EVE Online was released, we immediately started working on expansions for EVE. And when we worked on expansions, we continued that same flow of operations. So each expansion would now then just become this stage delivery. We would decide what, what, would then, what went into the expansion up front. We would do design on that, implementation, testing, and then publish it to our live servers, and it would be an expansion. And we've done uh, nine expansions to EVE to date, 
uh, using that system. Do exactly. you add anything? No, no. Okay, cool. Um, and so you can see the first one is in December 2003, Castor, and then our, our, our big push for, for, for excellence in, in, in Exodus in 2004. And then we get on the two uh, releases a year, the six month release cycle that we've, 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 we've been on ever since until Quantum Rise was released uh, last fall. Um, but then something changed. And uh, uh, we need to, 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 to man up and, and create something super awesome. And uh, the next expansion was Apocrypha. Um, so uh, this is the, the process that, uh, that uh, we used to work on when we created these expansions uh, for E Online. Uh, uh, everything, every feature that was implemented would go through this um, from, from idea to, to, um, to production. So it starts with, a, with a Noah just going like, hey! Yeah, like so uh, we're going to put in capital ships or something, like, yeah. like the old school thing. Like it's going to be titans and they're going to have this massive super weapon that's going to kill everything on the grid. It's a great idea. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so then, then we start, you know, plunking away in Excel and get a design and then approve it and send it off to the programmers and then they code some stuff that we need and then it comes back and we author, author some things and then the QA checks it out. Yeah, so there's a lot of lean, uh, lean time, lead time for game design ideas uh, and until their implementation. Uh, and the engineer review is like creating technical documentation around game design, so there's a lot of back and forth there. And then once it is started to be implemented, there will be a lot of back and forth as well with the game designers and the programmers on, you know, is this viable now when we're working on it and so on and so forth. So the game designs would evolve a lot uh, going through this. Uh, and once something is, is ready, it will be feature tested in-house with, uh, uh, with our QA department. So uh, everything will be built gradually over time and then handed off uh, in one big piece over to the QA department, uh, who would test it rigorously at the, at the far end of the release. And that, then it would be released to public testing on Singularity, uh, where we would do regression testing. And once everything is approved, we would put this on Tranquility uh, as an expansion. And this whole process would take a couple of months. Yeah. yeah. And so. Uh, the expansions then would be staggered. So the game designers, once the programmers were started to implement, the game designers would then start working on the next expansion. And they would start creating game design ideas in vacuum, maybe, and they would start piling up a lot of game design ideas on mm -hmm. our wikis and stuff like that. So we have a huge backlog of, of that. And yep. you know, only maybe, I don't know how much got implemented, but... No, not, not nearly all of it. So, right. But you know, 10 years worth of... Ideas and crap okay. on web pages. Um, all right, so uh, um, when we, we are tasked with doing Apocrypha, which was supposed to be our biggest, greatest, and most awesome expansion to date, uh, we had been uh, working with Scrum and Agile stuff within our organization for some time. We had been working with Scrum on pilot projects and on other projects that we were working on within the organization. And we've built up uh, 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 some knowledge within the company and uh, enough to kind of have the balls to take this uh, pretty well-oiled process to creating games and just revamping it completely and, uh, and, uh, and going all agile on it. Uh, and uh, Apocrypha was a, was a huge undertaking. It was uh, uh, last year uh, at FanFest. We announced that we would do something amazing, uh, which was Apocrypha. And uh, we needed to uh, refocus our company around EVE and deliver something amazing, and we did. And we rounded up people from all uh, three offices to do that. And, uh, um, and uh, to be able to manage that on a, on, a, on a global level, we also thought that Scrum could really help with that, because in Scrum and Agile, you really empower the teams to take ownership of a, of a part of the product and, and just go with it. And so uh, Apocrypha had uh, 120 developers working on it, which is the biggest number of developers uh, that have worked on, on EVE, even though we're 
uh, probably getting close to that now again with our you know uh, recent additions to our to our development team, which is always expanding. And it was developed in all three offices in three continents. So as probably most of you know, our offices are here in Reykjavik, in Atlanta, USA, and in Shanghai, China. And like I said, it was supposed to be the biggest expansion to date. And if you were here at FanFest last year, you remember that uh, the, the uh, oh yeah, there's one more thing in the end was that it's not going to be released in June or July like we usually do. It was going to be released in March, and it was released on March 10. So it was the shortest development time than that we had done you know, for any previous uh, expansion. Right, and we hadn't even started on it when we announced it at FanFest, and you know, in, in those short four months, we managed to put up you know, the biggest, baddest expansion we've ever done. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, we were, of course, busy with, 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 with finalizing Quantum Rise and, uh, mm -hmm. and gearing up for FanFest. And uh, last year's FanFest had a huge demonstration of walking in stations uh, called Bacchus, if you remember that, for those that were here. And there was a lot of energy that went into that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what was going to go into this expansion um, Apocrypha was, was, yeah, it, it was pretty high level. And so this um, well-oiled process that was working pretty well for us, we were quite successful in, in doing uh, computer games up to that time, we then morphed completely over to using Scrum and Agile, like this. And so now, instead of having this rigid waterfall type process, we now just have loads of scrum teams, and they work in this scrum cycle somewhat, and they create increments to, to Eve, and, and then we just pile them up. And once we have enough of increments, we have a release, and we can release. Um, so uh, how many in here know roughly what I'm talking about when I say scrum? Not you certified scrum masters, right? Really. All right. Uh, so, so not half. OK. So should we go over it maybe a little bit? Yeah, let's go over it a little okay. bit. OK. Uh, can anybody tell me uh, what, uh, where the name scrum comes from in this scrum, scrum things? Rugby. Rugby. There you go. You just won a towel. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it is rugby. And so the anal uh, analogy here is that in rugby, you have a group of people that work collectively in getting a ball from one place on the field to another by passing it back and forth and, and, and working collectively to reaching the end goal. And, uh, and uh, that's where the, the name comes from. So in, in Scrum, we have teams, these kind of small team sport size teams to that, are, uh, that are working at the common goal and are able to just pass balls between them to, to make it happen. Torfi likes to call them terrorist cells. And it does it like this, small little terrorist cells. Yeah. Right? All right, so these are the, uh, this teams. And the scrum teams are the heart and soul of, 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 of this. They are, the, uh, the, the, of the three roles, of course, the most important role. They are empowered and, and, and self-managing and self-organized. And uh, another role in scrum is product owner. A project owner uh, is responsible for uh, managing uh, an artifact of Scrum called the product backlog. Um, and then the third role is the Scrum Master. And Scrum Master is a facilitator uh, and uh, a sheepdog. Yep. He protects the teams and, and removes, removes imp impediments. Removes impediments, <laughs> exactly. And makes sure that uh, everybody is working uh, in the Scrum process, and that Scrum is uphold. Um, so this picture might seem a little bit confusing to the 57% of you that don't really understand what we're talking about, uh, but it all goes through this, what we call a product backlog. So in, in the product backlog, which is prioritized by the product owner, all the requirements are gathered. But instead of them being traditional software requirements, which are lengthy documents on how to implement stuff, they are very lightweight, short pieces of information. Um, and then uh, uh, we have uh, another artifact, which is the sprint backlog. And the sprint backlog uh, is a list of these requirements, often called often user stories, that the team selects to take into a sprint cycle and work on for these two weeks that our sprint cycles are. Um, 
And then within that backlog, uh, uh, sprint backlog, uh, the team expands the requirements or user stories or whatever it's in there to tasks which they flesh out between themselves. And then they go on to this two-week cycle, and every day they meet up for 15 minutes in what is called a daily scrum, where they uh, give status on what they're doing, commit to work for that day, and report any impediments that they might have. And those impediments are then solved by the Scrum Master immediately, so that the team can move on. All right. And then, uh, after these two weeks, a product increment is created, and uh, the product increment is fully functional working software, which in our case means a game that works, that builds, that runs on a test server, and we can play it and have fun. And that is then demonstrated to a larger group of people. Um, and in our cases, we have you know, spaceships uh, being projected and played with. Um, and then we have product owners, stakeholders, uh, whoever wants to participate, uh, review the, the new functionality uh, at this demonstration. Yeah, and these days, as we ramp up to Dominion, we're actually demoing stuff that we've just put onto CC. So this is like stuff that's out there for the public to test, and it's so, sort of part of their process of being done with the thing is that it actually is on CC yeah. and they demo from there. So, yeah, so that it, it emphasizes the, the you know, functional working bit of this. Uh, if you don't, you know, you ha the, the output of this is, is you know, quality code that is working and we can actually just play with on a public test mm -hmm. um, And then uh, that's a sprint. And once the team has, uh, has uh, completed the sprint, uh, they look back and to do a retrospective. And uh, for the guys that know some Asian languages, uh, this, this is Japanese and means kaisan, and which, which is Japanese for continuous improvement. And so in these sprint uh, retrospectives, the teams look back, inspect at what they did, and, and adapt changes to their process, environment, communications, or whatever it may be, so that they are continuously improving their uh, process, work, or communication. So, now everybody should understand Scrum in this room. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Uh, this is, of course, very high level, just really scratching the surface, and, uh, and, and yeah, there's, uh, there's a little bit more depth to it, but this is, these are basics. Okay, so in Apocrypha, like Noah pointed out before, we, uh, we, 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 uh, <coughs> We uh, created something that's called product managers. And because we are doing Scrum in a large-scale environment where we have multiple product owners, like illustrated before, uh, we have this master product owner and master product owner group, which is the uh, product managers. And in Apocrypha, that was Noah mm -hmm. and Torre, the senior producer for E1 Line. And uh, they were later also joined by Nonni, who is the technical director for, for, for E1 Line, because it made a lot of sense to have him also there. Yeah, we were, we were making decisions without being able to sort of back up the technical side of, you know, if it was a good idea or if it would scale or, you know, all, all sorts of things that really helped having him on the, on the product management team. Now. All right. And so the, uh, the, the biggest uh, challenge for the product managers is to, to have the vision for the product and be a, being able to convey it so that everybody who is working on it understands it and is bought into it. And with 120 uh, developers, that is not an easy task. No. Uh, and so um, for, uh, for Apocrypha, uh, we were doing, uh, doing an expansion for Eve, and these expansions are, are usually themed around four kind of types of expansions that we do. And this expansion mm -hmm. was supposed to be an exploration ex uh, uh, expansion, and uh, the theme was true exploration. And like Noah told you guys before, they were, you know, when we were at FanFest announcing what, would, what we were going to do uh, in, in those four months, this was basically you know, what we had. We had these bullet points. Well, these guys maybe knew a little bit what they wanted uh, this to be, uh, but... Uh, for me, it was just these bullet points, and maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on all this. No, thing. no, I mean, we just, so we, we actually, I mean, first we had a kind of a big list of features, and, and we showed it to the executive board, which is like 
my boss and you know the, the big bosses and and they hated it it was like it was way too much stuff and what's the focus and and so you know with our tail between our legs we we went back and we had another offsite meeting and we, you know, we thought okay okay what is it really about all this stuff that we want to do that and then we realized that it, this really about exploration and it was something that the players had been talking to us a lot about at last year's fan fest as well as they wanted more exploration so we said w what we'll do is we'll have the whole focus be on this true exploration and you know with the wormholes is the main thing and then you know new ai and all, all the other stuff but really you know distilling it down to that sort of main aspect that the whole company could go okay true exploration this is what this is where we're going this is right and so um Torve, who was uh, the, uh, the, the product lead product owner, the product manager, he came on, uh, on stage in CCP and presented the plans for Apocrypha uh, in a PowerPoint presentation that took place on the 2nd of October, this day, a year ago. Uh, and this was his presentation. This was, he, he had these things, and then he had Google kind of image references yeah. of you know what he envisioned uh, wormhole to be you know from some NASA picture. And yeah, and tonight at six you should go watch him in the in the big room because he'll have another presentation with Google images. Yeah, <laughs> like on what the minute is. We we love those in our PowerPoints. Right. It's good stuff. Okay, so uh, when we start working on Apocrypha, what we do is then we we get the collection of these product owners, and uh, like I told you before, the product owners are responsible for prioritizing a product backlog, and they're also responsible for conveying this vision to the team so that they kind of you know funnel that through them and uh, in apocrypha we had multiple product owners even we have had even more than five we had like eight or something but you know that's was it 11 didn't we? like we had 11 in atlanta teams. and yeah but i mean oh not 11 we, product owners yeah, so we, had, we had 11 oh, teams yeah, totally, yeah, okay yeah, okay and so yeah. each product owner would have uh, a, a, a segment of the product backlog, which would be his responsibility, and he would, you know, prioritize and create that product backlog and work with that in the in the Scrum framework. Right. So, like, wormholes would be one, and and Tech Three ships and how they merge together is another. And yeah. The yeah. So basically, each one of these things had the product owner for that area of the expansion, and they would organize that into a, a segment of the main product backlog. And then these teams who, uh, who, are, uh, who are going to be creating these features, they were working with the product owners on defining what this was. So we had these teams are cross-functional. It means that they have game designers, they have programmers, and they have testers. They may have artists or animators or whatever. They're cross-functional. And the, the key here is that the team themselves are defining what it is that they're building then building it, and then ensuring that it's working by testing it themselves. So there's no handoff that takes place like before. So they are, in fact, equipped with just doing anything that they need to do to create the output of that portion of the product backlog. Yeah, and, and what they're doing is you know, incremental and iterative, and they, they do this all within the two weeks, and then they show it to, to all the stakeholders, you know, I'm, I'm one of the stakeholders, but also people in maybe marketing or you know, the CEO himself will come to the demo and, and watch and see what they did and give feedback, and then they'll go and iterate on that. So, yeah. And so these teams uh, all have a Scrum Master, and these Scrum Masters, they work together uh, uh, at, in this kind of scaled up agile environment, and they create uh, what is called a Scrum of Scrums, uh, which uh, which is uh, all the Scrum Masters, they meet every day and they discuss the, the, the status and progress of the project and if there's anything that's blocking any team and if they can remove it collectively. And even maybe more importantly, if there's anything on the horizon that might be a problem or might be a blocker that anybody in any team should be aware of at any time. So these are facilitators. They are you know, looking ahead and making sure that everybody can go on uninterrupted. Um, yeah. So this is kind of the, the structure of, of, of you know, scaled up scrummy teams. Um, and so for Apocrypha, we, uh, we, we started off by creating a release plan. And so instead of creating a real release plan that usually would go from day one to, to the release date, and you know, we would design something, and then we would implement you know, a big portion of it, and then we would have testing in the end, we have this series of sprints. And um, uh, we had a little bit of a of a problem here because it's Christmas and people would, you know, 
not work on Christmas, so there's a little bit of a break there. We tried to get them to work on Christmas. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it was you know, one, two sprints, and then we had a hardening sprint. And a hardening sprint is a sprint where we don't do any feature development, but we take what we have and make it more production ready and do polish and you know, clean up the code and you know, tighten things. Um, and then uh, after Christmas, we came back and we did another kind of revamp on the release plan. And then we had three more sprints, and then we had the last hardening sprint uh, before the release day, which was, was on, uh, on March 10th, uh, six days after the, uh, the end of the last sprint. So, five sprints. Sprints is too weak, it's fast. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, how we construct these requirements in, an, in, in, in this agile environment. Uh, before, we would create design documents, and they could be long and lengthy. Uh, now we create something that's called a user story. And the user story is a very lightweight uh, requirement format. It really is one sentence that you can then augment with maybe one or two acceptance criteria, and then maybe add some more kind of detail to it. Uh, so these. Uh, uh, the reason for that is that because everybody who is creating the software works close together and they define the requirements themselves a lot by just verbal communication. So an example of a user story would be... Well, uh, let's see. An example of a user story would be, as a player, I can anchor a uh, system disruption beacon in Dominion. Ah, that was easy. And you know, and that might you know mean different things to different people. So uh, so to, to be able to refine those requirements, the peop uh, instead of writing lengthy documents, the teams working on them, they just ask questions and have conversations about what they mean until they have a collective understanding of what the the intention is here, and they they take just short little bullet points and mark those as acceptance criteria. So if I you know we need, would need to refine that better. An acceptance criteria to that would be? Okay, um, the acceptance criteria is along the lines of I, I'm around a Stargate and I have the beacon and I'm in an alliance and I have the roles and um, Kenny can come up with more stuff because we were just doing this earlier in the week. But um, yeah, and since he has the QA mind, he comes up with more, better <laughs> kind of things in, in the stories. But uh, yeah, so. You, you know, certain things that it has to pass, like what will we show at the demo? If right. you can do this and this and this, and what would, you know, what would be broken or what would be um, sort of imbalanced about it or that kind of thing, so. Yeah, so these are, you know, small, small pieces of, of requirements. Um, and, um, and user stories, so we have uh, a, a big user story, you know, create a, an MMO, and then we have uh, a big user story, create an, an expansion uh, for that. So, uh, and then within that expansion, we break that down, down into these major features, which were the, the features that, that, that we had up front, which are, uh, for example, wormholes. And then within the wormhole features, we have sub-features, which we break down even further. And then once we get to that user story level, those are usually things that are implementable within a very short period of time, maybe right. one, two, three, four, five days. So to put it in terms of Dominion, you've got EVE Online, then you've got the theme of, of the new sovereignty and, and you know, claiming yeah. space and owning space. Then a uh, major feature would be the actual sovereignty mechanics. And then a sub-feature of it would be the anchoring of the, the claim marker and then, yeah, the user story would just go into like specifics of that aspect. Right. And then tasks are just something that the teams have within themselves, how they plan out their work. And those are not requirements. Those are just artifacts of user yes. stories. And I ignore those things. No, no. OK. So in Apocrypha, it, used, it looked a little bit like this. This is a backlog. Uh, and uh, in the backlog, we have you know, the major feature of Tech 3. And then there is a sub feature of fitting and customization. And then these are user stories here. And mm -hmm. these are estimated at one to two days each. And, yeah. and so we can take in a, a couple or a handful of those into each sprint and you know, finish them completely and have them demonstratable at the end of, of two weeks. Holy crap. 
Oké. Ja. Talk a little bit about it. Oké, okay, so this, this is actually how we decide what's going to get cut. So we always, we always want to do way more than we can actually accomplish in the, in the short amount of time as we have. So we, we take all of our ideas and, and a lot of times we put them on stickies or on 3x5 cards and we have this massive stack of them and then uh, you know, we sort of organize them into you know, what, what do we need to do that like, the expansion really couldn't ship unless we didn't have this aspect of it. And then you start to get into the things that are like, okay, well, this, this is what the expansion couldn't ship without, and then these things are, like, we really also should do these things. And then you start to get in the coulds, which are basically, you know, things that are nice to have, but are probably not going to make it in. And then the won't haves is just stuff that's absolutely not going to happen. And as we get closer and closer to release, you know, it gets more and more important to make sure that the, the musts are really well defined and yeah. And so what's important here is that you know, the must represent the minimal usable subset of features, which means that you know, if we just do the must, the feature that we are implementing must, must have enough feature breadth for it to be viable as to be implementing this feature at all. Right. And we need to make sure that we are planning to do not only musts, but also shoulds and coulds would, would make the feature even better or more polished. Or right, or we want it to be fun, we don't want it to just the be user like... Experience. And so, so this is what we go by. Uh, and, you know, because in this volatile world of making games where plans constantly change, uh, uh, for us to be, have reassurance that we will hit must-haves is, is an absolute uh, must. Yeah, and ask, ask how often I change my mind. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're allowed to change your mind. I mean, that's what yeah. it is. So Agile and Scrum is created around uh, emergent and, and changing requirements. Because once you see something working, you say, aha, well, yeah. Yeah. wouldn't it be so much cool better? If if it, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. and then, voila, you have a new requirement. And you have to make changes. Mm -hmm. And then people hate me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so, uh, well, but this is all organized around uh, these release plans, and they are conducted uh, in, in such a way that we get all the developers working on, on creating the plan for us. So before we did Agile and Scrum, we would get a bunch of managers into a room, and they would kind of plan out how we would do an expansion. Uh, so they would create you know, all the requirements and then f task out all the tasks that needed and kind of try to map them out of, uh, for people over time. Yeah, it was very top down and it's really a recipe for failure because you've got just a few people are like you know, the crucial link to like deciding every, every task everyone's going to do for the entire length of you know, six months. And you know, the individual is actually better at you know, figuring out how much time it's going to take them to do things rather than a couple experts in a, in a room with a big, you know, Excel document or something saying... Yeah. It's going to take so now hours. we have all, everybody. Everybody who is working on, on the project is estimating the stories and is working on creating the plan for it. And we work in very small releases. So each, re each release is usually just three months. Um, so each expansion usually encapsulates two releases. And for the projects that we are running, uh, that we're working that have uh, longer lead times, like years or, or, or stuff like that, they, they also have this you know, short release cycle with, within them. And so what we do is that we take these features that we're working on and map them out. We identify what the, what the stories are that are associated with the major features and the sub-feature within that feature. So for example, the feature is tech three, and the sub-feature is, is fitting and customization, and the yellow boxes there are the stories that we created for that. And then we map that out and uh, we draw lines in, in it and we say, well, these are the must-have requirements for these, and these are the should-have requirements for these, and these are the could-have requirements for these. And whatever is not up there are the, you know, we won't have them. They're already out of scope. The could-haves are very likely to go out of scope at, at some time very soon. And then we have the teams working on the plans and we have them uh, have them, you know, map them out to sprint. So they tra take the stories and just drag them into big sheets of paper during these release planning days, and uh, and and they create multiple papers for for these sprints that we're working on. And we do this in our cantina. If anybody has been lucky enough to visit our office, this is our our, our fourth floor cantina, and in there we have. Uh, each team has a space uh, in, in which they work on the release plan for the release. And then we have a big wall for telecommunication to, to foreign offices at the far end. And uh, the team works, everybody's working together on creating the plan. 
Uh, there's a product owner there, Timo, and he's there with the team, kind of trying to figure out if this story should go into this sprint or if it should go into this sprint. <laughs> and then they're doing last-minute estimations, maybe. They, they've discovered a new story or, or there's a story that needs to be estimated and, and they are figure out collectively uh, how, uh, how much it will take by, 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 by playing planning poker, which is a, a cool exercise to collectively figure out how much uh, effort is, is required in a cross-functional environment because a programmer might, might think something takes one day but isn't necessarily thinking about the QA or whatever al is also associated with completing the task. So everybody is involved in kind of weighing and measuring the effort going into to, to, to finishing this. And, uh, and yeah, and then they just uh, go off and create release plans within the, for, uh, for multiple months within uh, the course of one day, and it kind of looks like this. Red Bull. Pizza. Alright, so in the end of such a plan, all the teams come together and they present the release plans for their team. And so they, they, they tell everybody who's in the release planning session what it is that they're going to be try to accomplish within the first sprint, within the second, the third, and so, so on. And everybody presents to everybody and everybody gets a chance to ask questions about the release plan and make sure that it makes sense to them and that all kind of interdependencies have been addressed uh, or any kind of, you know, uh, problems that might need to be addressed or anything like that. And uh, once that is done, everybody votes on the release plan. And they vote on confidence, and if, uh, if you're high on confidence, then we have a good release plan, and uh, we go ahead. Um, and then, once we are in the context of a release, we start sprinting, and each sprint is two weeks. And every sprint team is working on the exact same cadence, which means that everybody starts on the same day, and everybody finishes on the same day. And so they work from their backlog. Every sprint team now has their own backlog, prioritized by their own product owner. And uh, they work for two weeks. And then, in the end, they collectively demonstrate the, the fully functional working software from an integrated build. So everybody comes together at the end and, and, uh, and create one executable, one version of Eve that has the, the product increment, which is deployed to a to a one test server, uh, which uh, today is the public test server Singularity. Um, and then we have a lot of infrastructure in place to, uh, to do this at a global scale, because we have offices in, in these three places. And when we did Apocrypha, we had teams in all three offices. For Dominion, we have teams now in two offices, in Atlanta and, and Reykjavik. Yeah, we're right about here. So. Right. <laughs> and so. Uh, so uh, uh, every other Wednesday we go into uh, big conference rooms and, and video conference in and we are able to view the game uh, in uh, high definition with 30 frames per second between the offices using uh, uh, video conferencing equipment and so that in, if this office is presenting, this office can see it and they can see the presenters and, uh, and give feedback on, on, on what is going on. And uh, in Apocrypha, uh, where we, when we had three offices and, of course, three time zones, uh, we would then start in the morning with Shanghai, which would then be very late in the day, and then move over to presenting stuff from Reykjavik through the course of the day. And then in the afternoon, uh, which would be the morning for Atlanta, they would come online and, and present their stuff. Um, and then uh, for each uh, team, uh, the product owners and the team, they keep track of the velocity of the team within the sprint, and, uh, and uh, each team maintains a, a burndown for, for the release. And the burndown is, is the estimated story points or, uh, or ideal days that they had estimated, and, uh, and then how much they are completing in each sprint until they're finished. And then we have an aggregated chart here, and you can see that the columns are different, uh, but that's because the, uh, the teams are estimating themselves and they may have, may have different kind of joint values between what, what their estimates are. So, some might be estimating in oranges while others are estimating in apples. 
And you can see renovations here found out they had more work than they expected. Yeah, so the rat, rat dots here represent like new, new, new tasks that are emerging requirements that, that, that were not planned up front. New user stories are added to the release which are not, uh, and there are not other uh, user stories that are removed. And so if you get to a state here, then it's, it's very good to have uh, some could have or should have stories that you will then need to cut off from your, from your release. And yeah, so um, the in Apocrypha, this went pretty well for us. Uh, uh, Apocrypha uh, was a huge success for CCP, and uh, we attribute to, uh, a lot of that to, uh, to, uh, to Scrum and Agile and the, uh, how, how we did this. Uh, but also, of course, to the teams that were working in this context. Because in Scrum and Agile, the teams are empowered. They, uh, like I said before, they are the ones that are defining what it is that they're doing, building it, and making sure that it works. And therefore, the teams have more control, and they have more buy-in, and, and you know, they have more motivation. And uh, they create a lot of good stuff. Um, another really good thing uh, about that is that they're self-managing and self-organizing. Um, so. Uh, yeah, the teams uh, decide uh, how they conduct their work, how their team etiquette should be, when they should have their meetings. You know, who if somebody needs to go to a dentist, then yeah, then some some teams post the teams. their their stories up on a wall. Some some choose to just use software to, to track it. It's it's up to the teams what yeah. they want to do. Um, uh, doing release planning for the teams uh, uh, gives us uh, at CCB much better and concrete plans of what it is that we're doing. And yeah. so, uh, uh, Torvi often says, and quotes Eisenhower, I think it is, planning is, uh, plans are worthless, but planning is essential. And, uh, and plans that are created by the people who are actually doing this are, are, uh, uh, are, 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 are have more worth than, than plans done by managers, which are almost absolutely worthless. Yeah, and wh one other thing I want to point out is how important trust is in the whole thing. And, and, you know, that's just part of Scrum is that we hire brilliant people at CCP who are experts in their specific field and uh, we have to trust them. And, you know, when, they, when we go into release planning and let them just plan everything out themselves, it's, it's uh, very important that we have brilliant minds doing it, but it's also important for us to just be able to know that they're going to be doing amazing things. It's a little hard for a manager type person to initially, just, yeah, initially to just let them work, you know, sort of ground up instead of top down, but in the end it, it works out better because these people are the experts in what they're doing rather than having just a couple guys sort of saying everyone you're going to do this and you're that. So right. um, <laughs> Scrum is exciting. I don't know. What to <laughs> <laughs> Maybe now you should try uh, talking in, uh, in not such a monotone uh, voice. <laughs> I'm just saying. And, uh, and uh, doing this in the context of shorter, more frequent releases gives us, uh, uh, gives us better plans. Uh, be, to have teams uh, being able to, to, to have the vision for the future for, uh, for three months is something that they can easily do and really, you know, buy into doing um, and, you know, doing something for a, for a longer period of time uh, would probably be, I'll just end up in Noah changing his mind anyway. So. Yeah. Plus it lets us push out stuff to the players quicker as well. Yeah. Um, and then, um, uh, because this is large scale stuff, doing it in three continents, uh, having tools that scale up to this is, is, is important. And, uh, creating the infrastructure with the high definition communication, having software that can really allow people to collaborate over, over, over continents is also important in this context. Okay, so, uh, uh, during Apocrypha, we had some roadblocks that slowed us down. Uh, most importantly, it's the lack of continuous integration, and this is something that we're still working on at CCP to really, really get, uh, get good and, and, and going. Uh, so continuous integration is when the teams submit something uh, to, the, uh, to the source repository. Uh, all code is then automatically built and, and published to servers. 
Uh, and uh, when we will have that into place, we will have more assurance of the quality that we're doing and, uh, and are able to, to work at, uh, at a faster velocity. Um, we uh, also were suffering a little bit with the lack of streamlined deployment procedures which means that uh, when we had need to publish something out to CC or publish something out to Tranquility, there's a lot of manpower uh, that goes into doing that. And uh, for Quantum Rise, which was the expansion that we were supporting while doing Apocrypha, we had a lot of point releases. So uh, the lack of that streamlined process really slowed us down as well. Uh, that also has to do with uh, uh, the team teams being interrupted while we are running a live service of, of EVE. Uh, which always takes precedence over everything else. If something goes horribly wrong on Tranquility, we really need to act quick and act fast and make sure that it's up and working uh, soon. Yeah, so we have to pull programmers off of what they were working on. Programmers, QA people, whatever. Uh, and, you know, when you have a team that's in sprint and planning, interrupting it is going to hurt our logic as well. And we had our fair share of that. And, uh, and most importantly, maybe maintaining architectural in integrity. And even though we're just scratching the surface of Agile and Scrum here today, uh, one of the key things about, uh, about when you have people that are empowered and doing, doing uh, defining, building, and, and testing their own stuff is that architecture for the entire project is emerging from all over the place. Instead of being you know, just the technical director or just the senior guys that are creating the architecture for the game, we now have everybody emerging architecture from all over the, uh, the project. And maintaining a, a holistic view of that and maintaining architectural integrity, integrity over the entire project becomes uh, very hard when you do that. And, uh, and so we really need to, to, to maintain some discipline in our, how we work in terms of engineering to make sure that we are maintaining integ uh, architectural integrity throughout this all. Okay, and so this is the trailer for Apocrypha, which you've probably all seen several times, but it's cool in the context because it really shows how you can take you know, seven bullet points and have them just materialize in something that's actual in the game, working and, and, and playable and hugely successful. Yeah, and so yeah, if you paid attention to the trailer, you can see that you know all of the bullet points from from Noah's or Torres' original presentation kind of made it into there. Um, uh, these are statistics about uh, about the uh, Apocrypha that were gathered shortly after it was released, and it shows the conversion rate of subscriptions from trials on the days after people start a trial, and it compares the four three four previous expansions to Apocrypha. And as you can see there, uh, there's a huge change in that. And, uh, and then also shortly after Apocrypha was released, we, we uh, set the, the uh, peak concurrent user uh, record. record there uh, in March. Um, and then, yeah, it got good reviews. Uh, so it was very successful for us. And uh, the transition from, uh, from Waterfall to, to Agile was a joyous one. For CCP. Do you have a lot of questions? That's awesome.
because we have very limited time. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Albert. Just a, just a couple of quick questions. Where did CCP hear and learn about Scrum and Agile? And in my industry, when we go from different productivity um, paradigms, new ones like the TQM, the Lean, the Six Sigma, et cetera, right. we get a lot of resistance. Did you feel that too? And finally, you know, how, how are you guys doing with Dominion in this new category? Right. Uh, so that's four questions. Um, <laughs> so Agile, Agile and Scrum, uh, they uh, derive from uh, a lot of these practices. So they, they take a lot of the lean principles and the lean values and, and tend to wrap that around software development. Uh, we first learned about uh, Scrum and Agile uh, at uh, the Game Developers Conference. It was introduced into this industry by, uh, uh, by uh, a colleague of ours. Uh, who had worked at a studio that, that did Scrum at, and, at Agile, and they started talking about that uh, at TDC in 2005, and have done that uh, ever since. Um, and the, uh, the resistance was, was, was some. And uh, it kind of worked like this. So we implemented Scrum and Agile at the, at the grassroots first in pilot projects and stuff like that, and uh, where we could do it without you know, uh, too much resistance. Uh, the middle management tier will always go for the status quo. So if the status quo is we're doing this, they will go for that. And, uh, and, and, and they will resist uh, the change. And it wasn't until you know, we can demonstrate that this is working well at the grassroots that the, the high-level management comes and kind of pulls it together uh, because you need to implement it at the grassroots and, and, and support it at the top level for this to be a successful rollout. At least that's how it was for, for CCP. And I've heard that being echoed a lot in the kind of agile uh, community. It's also good to have evangelists. Like Ali really like drank the scrum Kool-Aid and he was really gung-ho about it. Right. And then when I started learning about it, I was getting really excited about what we could do with it. So yeah. it, it was good to have people around who okay. were like. And so, and the fourth and final one is how is this going for us in Dominion? Um, it, we're still doing Scrum and Agile. Uh, we learned a lot of new things, and we have, uh, we have uh, stumbled on a, a lot of new challenges. Um, it's going fairly well, uh, but I'm, for the most part, yeah. for the most part. But this is like this is a very kind of uh, you know continuous improvement process. So uh, Dominion has revealed a lot of new uh, uh, challenges for us, which we are working on on solving as we go along, and by, by applying that you know, Kaizen mentality to what we're doing, continuously improving our, our processes, work and environment, then and, you know, it gets better all the time. Go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's a really it's a really good point, and it it, it goes hand in hand uh, with uh, with uh, so Scrum and Lean also really want to will emphasize uh, knowledge transfer within organizations, and so uh, as a as a value of that, uh, we encourage people to not have too much ownership of their cone code, and if people are getting too specialized in in code, we want them to you know. To, to know the code and support the code, and welcome others to, to learn their code so that we can spread knowledge within our organization. Because if we silo us too well within, within that, uh, I mean, what happens if somebody gets hit by a bus? We're fucked. And uh, so we, it's, uh, we really want to encourage more flow and more knowledge transfer throughout our uh, organization. That being said, that means that you know, for a short period of time, uh, we will maybe have uh, less velocity in implementing something because somebody's ramping up or learning the code, but uh, in the big picture or over time, uh, where we have more people learning more aspects of the code, uh, uh, over time we will have even more velocity and be able to go faster. And that's, again, also derived from, from a lot of lean practice. How are we on time? Ah, we're, we're good. We have five more minutes. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, 
No, no, we had, we had the, the line managers or the discipline leaders come up with what would be the best uh, way to do the teams. And that is probably not the best way to go about it, uh, but it's, it's really hard to, to start any other way. So the alternative is just to present the feature set and put everybody in a room and say, go self-organize. And uh, because people don't know what they're self-organizing to, they don't know Scrum, they don't know Agile, they don't know why they're doing this, they don't really understand the values, uh, we, we, and, uh, we took the approach to, to you know, organizing them, that for them uh, in the beginning. And, uh, and then teams evolve over time, we try to have them as cohesive as we can, so that they will, they will you know, gel more and, 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 and gain more velocity over time. Um, but initially, they were just chosen by managers. No, 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 no. We we still, you know, still, still, still use the same thing. Yeah. Uh, hopefully soon uh, we will have, you know, enough trust. Yeah. And and everybody in the organization will have more knowledge about why we're doing this because. But, yeah, I mean, the teams sort of have a natural like certain game designers are more on the industry side, and certain game designers will maybe balance NPCs more. And so if we have a team that's say working on the sleeper AI. Uh, one of the game designers is sort of a natural fit for that team, whereas another guy who is just doing like combat balancing would be maybe on a different team that's focusing on that. So, that it, I mean, there's sort of a natural place where these guys fit because yeah. they're, you know. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. They, they probably would also be naturally able to figure that themselves and, and organize around that. Yeah, and sometimes we bolster up the teams. Like if, if um, a certain feature is struggling, we'll move somebody over who's on a team that's, you know, um, whizzing ahead and or, or like sort of twiddling their thumbs because they don't have a lot of stuff to do. So. Thanks, um, I understand 120 developers. I'm, I'm interested in knowing how much was your outsourcing for artwork involved? In Apocrypha? Yes. None. No, no, no. It started out by being none. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that we did, uh, that we had, uh, so the outsourcing was all done about around the TAC three ships. And that was the kind of biggest art pipeline stuff. And we originally said, OK, we need to do this fast, furious, and, uh, and you know, extremely lean. Uh, we are going to just do this all in-house. So we take, took all our artists of all projects and put them on creating tech free ships. They did concert art, they did modeling, and did everything. Um, and so after the first sprint, we realized that they would never get to all of it. Yeah, and I so wanted more variations, damn it. <laughs> more variations. So. All right. So, uh, uh, so we, um, uh, so we, uh, we uh, outsourced one race, I think, or so one th one fourth of the of the uh, of the uh, of the entire yeah the sub subsystem uh, structures. Yeah. Um, your different groups that we've got in Shanghai and Atlanta and mm -hmm. here are they all parts uh, designer, developer, programmer? What sort of you said experts? What mm -hmm. Yeah. Experts are yeah. Uh, uh, so they are spe sp general specialists, <laughs> mostly. And mm -hmm. so you will have you know, a guy that's an expert UI programmer and a guy that's an expert database programmer, and they will share some generalities in between them. And so a team may also have like an animator, or a team may have uh, a technical artist. right? Uh, but then we have all of our uh, normal artists. We don't put them on, on Scrum teams. We have them work separately in kind of more of a pipeline process work and in which we want to uh, adopt more kind of lean production processes too. All right. Yeah. yeah. You guys talked about a more efficient development process, but mm -hmm. it's a, a bottoms up management approach. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about when you engage the senior managers in the development process, i.e. I, there was a sprint chart. Right. What stages of those sprints are you communicating back up to the senior managers? Well, we don't really, so status, uh, the status is like that, the sprint burn or the release burn done is giving every two weeks because then we have empirical data that shows how much velocity we had in those two weeks. And then uh, status, I mean, so the, the, the biggest measurement of status is the working game. And so we invite all the senior managers to come down and see the working game and, you know, and ask questions about it and try it in person rather than writing lengthy status reports and sending them up. Okay. Yeah, so every two weeks. Every two we, weeks. We've also got we've also got a presentation to the execs monthly thing for. Yeah, but that's well. like a broad kind of project overview that would that every was. Two weeks and the sprint, they're involved. They're involved, yeah. yeah, yeah. But also leading up to these release plans, they are they're looking at what we're taking into into these releases, and you know, maybe 
have their input in terms of scope and yeah. each, or each strategy each or whatever. Each team writes a charter, and the charter is like, you know, rigorously gone over by the execs. They, they sort of make sure, like every sentence, are you sure this is the what, you know, so. Mm -hmm. All right. One more question, and then okay. we are here. In EVE, there are developers uh, on the team. And uh, my personal opinion is on that is that if you have uh, uh, scaled up development with more than maybe four teams, uh, it is probably it is, it is a benefit uh, of having them on the team. Because when you ha go into the scrum of scrums, they are involved with the problems that they are trying to solve. Uh, if you have a smaller outlet, having dedicated Scrum Masters that, uh, that, uh, that are just solving these problems, maybe you would have two Scrum Masters for four teams or something like that, then th those two guys have such a c close kind of communication loop that, that they and the more bandwidth to, to solve all that. So it's different for different projects we have. We have projects that only have four teams, and they often have uh, just one dedicated Scrum Master or two. Uh, but uh, in EVE, we prefer to have them on the team because then they have more buy-in in solving the actual problems. The downside to that, of course, is that they spend time from doing development in doing Scrum Mastery stuff. But, you know, we feel that that is a better approach. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. you.